We'll now turn to God's holy word and we'll read together from the book of Revelation. We'll read together a few different portions out of chapters 8 through 11. Chapters 8 through 11 will actually be our text for this morning. We'll be dealing with that part of Revelation. Since it's a large part, we're not able to read all of it. Um, if you had a chance to read it before, that's great. If, if not, you might want to look at that later on today or this week. You might want to read these uh, chapters. Uh, so we'll start in Revelation chapter 8. We'll read together the first uh, six verses, and then we'll turn to chapter 9, and then finally to chapter 11. So chapter 8 of Revelation, beginning at verse 1. So the situation is that in the previous chapters, the Lord Jesus came and he opened the first six seals, and now we'll see that he opens the seventh seal. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw seven angels stand, who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel, who had a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all God's people on the golden altar in front of the throne. The smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of God's people, went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it to the earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Then the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. And then what well, you'll find in the rest of the chapter um, is that the, the trumpets are being uh, sounded one after another. And then we turn to chapter 9, and we'll read together first four the first 12 verses, and here we start with the, the fifth trumpet. The fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. When he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like the smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss. And out of the smoke, locusts came down on the earth and were given power like that of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were not allowed to kill them, but only to torture them for, for five months. And the agony they suffered was like that of the sting of a scorpion when it strikes. During those days, people will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. The locusts looked like horses prepared for battle. On their heads, they wore something like crowns of gold, and their faces resembled human faces. Their hair was like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like, bre they had breastplates, like breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was like the thundering of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. They had tails with stingers like scorpions, and in their tails they had power to torment people for five months. They had as king over them the angel of the abyss, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek is Apollyon, that is, destroyer. The first woe is past, and two other woes are yet to come. And so the the other two woes would be the sixth seal and the seventh. I mean, the, the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet. And then let's turn to chapter 11, verses 14 through 18. Chapter 11, 14. The second woe has passed. And this is the second woe is the one that is actually the sixth trumpet. And the sixth trumpet is one that speaks about war here on earth. The third woe is coming, which is the most severe woe. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who were seated on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, 
your people who revere your name, both great and small, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. So far, our reading from God's holy word. The words we just sang from Psalm 75. You know, as the psalmist speaks about God who comes in judgment. And so God already in the Old Testament, God's people were looking to the Lord God as the one who would come and bring his judgment upon the wicked, upon those who had oppressed his people. And this morning in the book of Revelation, we see that God continues to maintain that same, that same news. He's a God who will bring his judgment upon those who have opposed him and who oppose his people. This morning, our text will be in the book of Revelation. We'll continue to work our way through this book, looking at the overarching picture uh, that God gives to us, the overarching message uh, of uh, this particular uh, book. And our text then for this morning will be chapters 8 through 11. So, brothers and sisters of our Lord in Jesus Christ, if you uh, thought that there was a lot of symbolical lang language and the message last week in the afternoon in this previous section. The section that we're going to look at today is even more densely packed with symbolic language. If you know your Old Testament well, you know many of the stories in the Old Testament and the events, and you know a lot of what the prophets have written, you'll recognize that a lot of that symbolic language comes, almost all of it comes from the Old Testament. A lot of this symbolic language reminds us of the very things that God did for his people Israel in the past. And therefore, the symbolic language is a subtle reminder for us today that God will do similar things in the world today. As God showed himself to be in full control of the history of his people back in the Old Testament. So the symbolic language that comes out of the Old Testament reveals that God continues to exercise the same control over the history of this world for the sake of his church today. In the previous section, chapters 4 through 7, John there saw the Lord Jesus opening the, the seven seals on the scroll that was given to him. And we saw him opening the first six. And so this new section, we will see him opening the seventh, the final seal. And as he opens that seal, I, I think we would all expect that that seal would reveal the final, the great judgment of God that comes over the whole world. But instead, John hears seven trumpets. And each of these trumpets sounds a warning from God. A warning from God that his judgments are already, today, already coming on this world. And so these trumpets are a warning to the people of this world. Repent. Repent and bow down and worship the Lord God as the one who sits there on his throne in heaven. And while these trumpets are a warning to the people of this world, at the same time, beloved, these trumpets are a comfort and they are an encouragement for us as the church, as God's holy people. For it is the cry of God's people we heard earlier. Remember in chapter 6, verse 10, there you hear the cry of God's people, How long, Lord, until you will judge the inhabitants of the earth? And God now reveals, I have heard the cry of my people. I am already bringing my judgments on the people today, even as I speak. And these judgments, God reveals, are going to lead up to the final and the great judgment with the coming of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, on the last day. And so this, this morning we will listen to God's word under, under this theme. The trumpets sound the judgments of God upon the earth. The trumpets sound the judgments of God upon the earth. Another theme, we'll look at three things. First of all, we'll look at God's judgments on the earth. Secondly, God's witness to the earth. And the third place, God's kingdom comes to the earth. And you'd understand, that's why I put in brackets, and then the third woe. So this is a woe. This is the worst thing that could happen. You can say that the kingdoms, that God's kingdom comes to the earth. And we'll explain that when we get there. 
The Lord Jesus opened the seventh seal. And John says there was silence in heaven for about a half hour. We know that in the Old Testament, silence often precedes the God's judgment coming on the earth. The silence is to prepare us and warning us that horrible things are about to happen as we witness the judgment of God coming. When there is utter silence, then, then you know that the people are also breathlessly, breathlessly uh, anticipating what is about to happen. Horrible things are going to happen. And then after the half hour of silence, John says, I saw seven angels with seven trumpets. And then there was another angel, an eighth angel, you can say, who had a golden censer in his hand and he was standing before the altar of God. And he was given much incense that he might offer with, together with the prayer of all of God's people. You see in the temple, the incense was, was offered and it represented the prayers of God's people as these prayers went up to the Lord God in heaven. And, and now John says that he saw this angel with that censer. Uh, he filled the censer now with fire from the altar. Well, this is not just any fire. This is holy fire. It's fire that's dedicated to God. What does he do with that censer filled with fire? He hurls it down on the earth. And the result is, John hears peals of thunder. There are rumblings. There are flashes of lightning. There's an earthquake. And as we look at this picture, what we see here, beloved, that what is happening here is a result, or this is, you can say, it's a response to the prayers of God's holy people. In which God's people cried out earlier, How long, Lord, will you allow all of this to continue? And in response to that prayer, what does the angel do? He hurls the censer with fire from the altar here upon the earth. God reveals that he is already, already pouring out his wrath and his anger upon the world in the days of John. And he continues to do that. And he continues it even today. And he will continue it also in the future. And he does some response to the prayers of his people. And God now reveals his judgments by sending on this earth. Uh, he reveals the judgments on this earth in the sounding of the, semp of the seven trumpets. Each trumpet reveals a different aspect of God's judgment. And as we listen to each one of these uh, trumpets, you need to understand that there is a progression here in these judgments of God. It's not a progression in time, but a progression in severity. You see, each one of these judgments, they are being carried out uh, throughout the, the history of the world, but the severity of these judgments will be different in different situations. God is not always punishing the world in the same way. Uh, there are different kinds of punishment for different kinds of situations. The first, the first four trumpets, you can say they deal with physical harm that God's judgments will bring on the wicked. Well, the last uh, three uh, will we'll speak more in, in a spiritual way. And when we talk about the three woes that God brings upon the earth, the three woes, are, th this is when the, the judgments of God becomes even more in, intensive. Three woes is like hell breaking forth here on the earth. You'll also notice as you read through this section that some of the plagues that God sent to the people that God sent on, on Israel in order to free Israel from, out of Egypt are also mentioned here in this section. So that as God punished the Egyptians with many plagues, God will now punish the wicked and the unbelieving with many of the same plagues today. So let us look very quickly at the first four trumpets, beginning in chapter 8, verse 7. The first trumpet warns about hail and fire that is mixed with blood, and it is hurled down on the earth. And a third of the earth is burned up, including the green trees and the grass. The second trumpet warns that God's judgment will not only harm the earth, but also the sea will be harmed as a huge mountain all ablaze is cast into the sea. And a third of the sea turned into blood. 
And so what it shows us, the first two trumpets show us, is, is not only will terrible things happen here on this earth, there might not only be great fires and storms and tornadoes and whatever else may happen here on the land, but God also says, but there will also be great disasters on the sea, from things like shipwrecks to tsunamis that will kill thousands of people when it comes on the land. And then there's a third trumpet. And here a great star called Wormwood fell from the sky and turned a third of the rivers and lakes bitter so that many died uh, from the waters. Perhaps we can think here about the flooding that, uh, that will often result in great damage, even death, uh, flooding of rivers or the pollution of rivers and, and, and lakes. And then at the sound of the fourth trumpet, a, a third of the sun was struck as well as the moon and the stars. A third of the day was without light as well as the night. Well, you know that long ago, uh, people were terrified of solar and lunar eclipses. When that happened, the people trembled. They thought something's happened to the world. And the Lord God may indeed be referring to things like that. On the other hand, beloved, can you imagine? Can you imagine that suddenly a third of the sun was no longer shining? Wouldn't that have horrible, horrible consequences also for this earth? Now, there are a few things we need to keep in mind as we look at these symbols. Right, we're dealing with symbols through which the Lord reminds us that when we experience many of the natural disasters, whatever kind they may be, we have to also see in those natural disasters, we need to see the hand of God at work. And we need to understand it is God's judgment on this world already today. And yet each time that we are told about God's judgment on the world, we're also told that only a third of the world, only a third of the world is affected. That tells us that God is still being merciful. That God does not, that God does not allow these disasters to strike the whole world or to destroy all of mankind. In fact, these disasters, they are like trumpets. Or you can think in terms of today, sirens that go off when there's a war, where there's dangers. Trumpets that, that sound a warning to mankind of the great judgment that is coming. What's God doing? Lord, beloved God is causing pe people in this world to pause. He's causing people to, to think about What's the meaning of all of this? You know, people still get it wrong. Today, people are afraid of climate change. But they don't see the hand of God in the things that are happening also with regard to the climate. Right? They don't recognize God. Instead, they, they think that somehow they need to be like God. As if somehow we, mankind, as we can fix the climate, we can save the world, as if God is not in control of those things. And what you see is also that their arrogance will lead to their further, to their further destruction. Now before the fifth angel is sounded, John heard an eagle flying through the sky calling out, Whoa, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth. And he hears these woes because of the trumpet blasts, because of the trumpet blasts that are about to be sounded. Now the expression inhabitants of the earth is an expression that is used in other parts of scripture as well, not for God's people, but for those who are unbelieving, those who reject God and reject the Lord Jesus. And so when we hear woe in scripture, watch out, that means watch out. For something horrible, something terrible is about to happen on the earth. And so here at the sound of uh, the fifth trumpet, the first woe, John saw a star had fallen from the sky to the earth. Notice past tense, it had fallen. And this star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. The abyss really nothing more than a bottomless pit. The abyss here represents hell before the final judgment is going to come. This is the place where you can say where the powers of wickedness are, are being kept to, to, today. And 
The wickedness has no boundaries. It has no end to it. And the star here, the star represents Satan. Satan, who, whom Jesus told his disciples already in the Gospels, he saw being thrown out of heaven and fallen to the earth because there was anticipation of Christ's victory. And so here this star that has fallen, who is Satan, is given by God the key to the abyss, to, the, to, that, pit of to that endless pit of wickedness. And our comfort is that even the devil here, beloved, even the devil is limited in his actions by the Lord God. It's the Lord God who gives him this key. It's the Lord God who allows Satan to open the abyss. And when he does so, what we see is that the smoke rose up from the pit and it darkened the sun and the sky. And then out of the smoke, locusts came on the earth and they were given power like that of scorpions. The description of the locusts in chapter 9, verse 7 through 10, reveals how horrible, how terrifying these locusts are. They strike fear, fear in the heart of all of mankind. And they have a king ruling over them. And the king is called the destroyer. And so these evil powers that are released from the abyss, they come and they attack. What do they attack? They attack the souls of mankind. What they're doing is they're removing from the people of this world, they're, remo they're removing the light of the gospel. They're taking away the knowledge of the goodness and the mercy and the grace of God. Right? They cause so much spiritual anguish in the souls of the people because they take away any hope. And because the people now are in despair, because they have no hope, because there's only darkness in their life, what do they seek? They will seek death. They long to die because they have no reason to live. But they will not find it because the truth of God has been darkened. The locusts are not allowed to kill mankind. Notice that. They're not allowed to kill them. Only to torture them. And then even the, only to torture them for five months. In other words, what is God doing? God will limit the attacks of the destroyer. He will give opportunity for, for people to again see the light of the gospel and to repent. But what about our place? What about the believers in all of this? Well, notice what John hears or sees in chapter 9 verse 4. There the locusts are told they may only harm those who do not have the seal of God uh, there on their foreheads. Right? God's people who have, been, who have received the seal of God, remember the 144,000 who were sealed earlier? They cannot be touched. They may not be harmed. They are protected by God from this evil. Well, How? How are they protected? Well, beloved, they are protected by the light of the gospel. They're protected by the knowledge of the Lord Jesus that gives them light. It's the Holy Spirit who comes and who protects us. How does He protect us? He protects us through His Word so that the darkness of sin cannot overcome the light that is within us. What we're told here is that these enemies, they cannot destroy the soul of the believer. Great comfort. That as God's people, we may trust the Lord God to protect us. Because he sealed us with his seal. And then, then the sixth trumpet is, blow, is blown. And the sixth trumpet describes war. Describes all wars, past and the present and in the future. Now remember, war was already mentioned earlier in the fourth seal, where it describes the sufferings that, that the church faces in this world, and the church will also uh, suffer because of the wars on this earth. But now the trumpet also talks about, now this trumpet also talks about wars, but it reveals, but it talks about wars here from a different perspective. It describes war here now as a judgment of God upon the unbelieving. Right? The believers, they cry out, how long, Lord? 
And what does the Lord do? The Lord points out and he says, my judgments are already coming here upon the world. The troops are already going across the world, engaged in battle. And you notice that the number of the troops here are 200 million troops. 200 million? Those days have been incredible. To, to today, it's still an incredible number. And that 200 million troops are a symbol uh, for those wicked armies that have marched around the world throughout the ages. And they kill a third of mankind. We know how many are killed in warfare. But also here, God again limits the destruction that they can do. As you look at this prophecy, you can say that this prophecy is being fulfilled even today, beloved, when, when a little man in Russia comes and he invades a weak nation. And he boasts about his great achievements and his accomplishments. And we see that the world cowers in fear before this little man because he bullies them with his little army. The world has lost its mortal resolve to stand up to the evil here in this world. And beloved, because of that very fact, God's judgment on this world is being felt also there today in Ukraine. It's not just a local battle. The whole world stands cowering before this monster. And God's purpose for all these judgments on the unbelieving world becomes clear in chapter 9, verse 20, perhaps the most important part of this whole section. The rest of mankind who were not killed, we read, by these plagues still did not. They still did not repent of what they were doing. They did not stop worshiping demons. They didn't stop worshiping idols of gold or silver or the material things of this earth. Chapter 9, verse 4 clearly reveals to us what God's purpose is behind these judgments. His purpose is to warn the world and to warn the people of the impending doom of the final judgment. In His mercy, the Lord still gives mankind the opportunity to repent. But they refuse to heed the very warnings of God. So what is the message for us as the Church of Christ? On the one hand, the message is that we need to repent. Repent every day of our life again and again of our own sins. Acknowledge God as our God. But the other message for us, beloved, is this. The message is do not fear the powers of this world. Do not fear the forces of spiritual darkness because the Lord Jesus is on your side. Or don't take them for granted. Don't act as if they don't matter, they can't do any damage. But also understand, and if this courage within you to know that, that those spiritual forces of darkness cannot destroy you if the Lord Jesus is there on your side. And while we often face troubles of this life and we experience those things, yet, beloved, in the midst of those difficulties, you have that assurance that God's people will stand strong and we will stand secure in the power of our Lord. Not our own power, in the power of our Lord. And therefore we do not despair. But beloved, open your eyes and see that God's judgment, it is coming. And when it comes in all of its fullness, and he will destroy the wicked, but he will then also lift up the righteous who are in Christ Jesus. And then before the seventh and the final trumpet of judgment is blown, there's again, there's an interlude between the sixth and the seventh trumpet from chapter 10, verse 1, to chapter 11, verse 13. John now sees a vision in which God commands the gospel to go and to be preached into the world. And when we look through this section, it's, it's, not e it, it's so easy to get overwhelmed by all the, the detailed imagery. Almost all of the images come, again, out of the Old Testament events and things that the prophets have already written. Think about this as a painting. I think I already mentioned that last time. Think of it as a painting that has all kinds of little details in it. But when you look at the entire painting, the point that the artist is making is clear. And those little details that you find throughout the painting, they simply add depth 
to the very point that he's making here in that painting. And so as we look at this description, we see that John sees another scroll, a little one. This is different from the scroll in chapter 4. This little scroll is there in the, uh, is there in the hand of a mighty angel who comes from heaven. And he is told, John is told to take the scroll and to eat it. And he says, it tastes the sweetest honey in his mouth, but my stomach turned sour. All you can say is, as the first scroll held much information, so this scroll holds additional information. But this additional information is not revealed to us. Only John sees it. He is told that he is not to write down what he, what he hears the seven thunders has spoken to him. The seven thunders then spoke to him the contents of this little scroll. And so it seems that God wants to, to spare us from seeing some of the other horrible things that will happen here on this earth. And then John is commanded to, to prophesy. Prophesy again to all the peoples of the earth. So you can say that the gospel that he preaches tastes sweet as honey. You can say it's the most wonderful thing to be able to, to bring the word of God. But the reaction to the message one is one that turns the stomach and sour. Then John is to go and he's to, to measure the temple of God together with the altar and all the worshipers, the believers that are in it. But he's not to measure the outer court of the temple for that court is given for the Gentiles to be. And then John also sees that the Gentiles that will trample the holy city for 42 months. Now in the Old Testament, the holy city would be, would be Jerusalem. But here I think the holy city needs to be understood that this is the place where God dwells. This is the church. This is the place where the temple of God is. And so for 42 months, the Gentiles will trample on the holy city that is on the church of Jesus, of Jesus Christ. For the unbelieving cannot tolerate God's people, but they will oppose Christ. And they will oppose also his church. And then John hears God say in chapter 11, verse 3, he says that he will appoint two witnesses. And these two witnesses are represented by two olive trees and two lampstands, Old Testament imagery for God's prophets. And they will prophesy for 1,260 days. Now again, what do we do with those numbers? Well, first I need to notice 42 months in which the Gentiles will trample over the holy city is the same amount of days and time as the 1,260 days in which these witnesses witness to Jesus Christ. And so the 42 months or the 1,260 days, they represent that whole period of time in which the Lord Jesus Christ first came to this world and when he will come again in his second coming. That means, beloved, that we are now living today in this particular time frame. And then we're told that these witnesses, these witnesses of God, they're powerful. Because if anyone tries to harm them, what happens? Fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. Right? They have power to shut up the heavens so it will not rain. And they have power to turn the water into blood. And they have power to strike the earth with every kind of plague. If you know your Old Testament, you remember... It reminds us of the power of Elijah. He prayed and that the rain might stop. He did so for three years. Or Moses who prayed and that the water might be turned to blood and the Nile River turned to blood. The Lord reminds us, beloved, when his servants in the Old Testament, when they spoke his word, the word had power to bring harm against the world. Egypt, they felt the power of Moses' words. And they felt God's judgment come upon their land. Now the point here is not that God will use the words of his witnesses today to do the same, the exact same things. The situation today is different. But the point is this, that the gospel has great power to destroy the works of the evil one. Right? The reason that the wicked, they, they want to trample the holy city, they want to trample the people of God, is because they realize the power of the gospel to conquer the hearts of people. And so what John sees next turns his stomach sour. 
When the two witnesses finish their testimony, the beast comes up from the abyss and kills them. The bodies will die in the public square of the great city. That's figuratively called Sodom. Sodom is the city of great immorality. And of Egypt, Egypt is the place of slavery and oppression. This is the place also where John says where the Lord Jesus was crucified. And so the, these witnesses of the gospel, they experience the same fate as the Lord Jesus experienced when he was in Jerusalem. And for three and a half days, their bodies lie in the public square and they are refused a burial. Why? Because the inhabitants, they gloat over their bodies. They celebrate because these two witnesses had tormented those who live on the earth with the gospel. Right? They didn't want to hear about the Lord Jesus Christ. That very gospel tormented their conscience. But, but they are in for a rude awakening. After three and a half days, the breath of God entered into them. They rose to life and terror struck all those who saw them. You see, beloved, the point here is that the church will often be persecuted. At times it may seem as if they have been defeated and been killed. The bodies are lying, strewn over the earth. Perhaps if you remember anything about history, in the time of the French Revolution, the people, they thought they had overthrown religion. They boasted that the Bible would only be found in the museum. They gloated that they had destroyed the Christian religion. But what happened was the French Revolution quickly fell by the wayside and was destroyed. And the church rose up. And the church continued to witness to the Lord Jesus. Well, you think under communist uh, Russia long ago, uh, the state thought that the church was dead. And yet when the communist regime uh, fell... The Christian church again began to flourish in Russia. Beloved, that, that is alarming to the enemies of the church. Why? Because the rise of the church is a clear sign of the power of the gospel. And it is a clear sign of the power of the one who sits on the throne there in heaven. Understand full well, beloved, that if the God is not standing behind his church then his church would fail and we would be destroyed, never ever to rise again. But if anyone fights against Almighty God, the reality is they will fail. And so the evil beast, he fails because God is the one who sits on his throne and the Lord is bringing his judgments upon the world. And so, beloved, here is... God's people, we're also encouraged. Encouraged to witness to the world that gospel message of salvation in Jesus Christ. It's not just an encouragement, it's even a command of God to go and to witness the name of the Lord Jesus. And to do so, it will be sweet as honey. But be ready. Be ready for the hostile reaction that may turn your stomach sour. The message of salvation in Jesus Christ, it will prick the conscience of the hearers. And when you prick the conscience of a person, they will either become hostile to you and they'll become angry, or they will repent and they will acknowledge their sin and they will seek forgiveness of the Lord. So, beloved, be faithful also in your witness of the Lord. And then finally, Finally, the seventh and the final trumpet is sounded, which is the third woe, the worst thing that can happen on the earth. The third woe is indeed something that caused all mankind to tremble because it will destroy the life of all those who oppose the Lord God who sits on his throne. You see, when the final and the seventh and final trumpet is blown, and the final judgment of God comes on the earth. And then no one, no one can escape the wrath or the fury of God. And at the sounding of this trumpet, chapter 11, verse 5, John then heard loud voices in heaven say, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Messiah, 
and he will reign forever and ever. And then there are the 24 elders who represent the entire church of Jesus Christ. They come and they worship God and, and they praise him. It's not really weird. After all, they're the other images of the other trumpets we would expect some horrible picture to describe the final judgment. We won't find those horrible pictures until later on in the book of Revelation. Instead, what we hear here, we hear the voices that praise God for the kingdom of God has finally come. Keep in mind, remember this, that the trumpets are sounded not for our benefit. The trumpets are sounded to the unbelieving people of this world. And as believers, think about it, as believers, the worst thing that we could hear is that the devil has won. That would send us into utter despair. But now think of it from the perspective of the unbelievers of this world. What's the worst thing they could hear? The worst thing they could hear is that the Lord Jesus has won. That his kingdom has come. Christ's victory, beloved, means that they have lost. And that they will now live eternally under the wrath and under the very judgment of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. You see, that's why, as believers, God's people, the return of the Lord Jesus is the most wonderful thing for us. For the suffering and the torment that we have endured here on this earth will now be turned to eternal joy. And so the question that, that Revelation answers for us is, has the Lord God abandoned us? Has the Lord God abandoned the world in which we live? Has God forgotten about his people? And the answer is never, never. No, God is still sending his gospel into the world. We're still commanded by the Lord to be faithful witnesses of the Lord Jesus. And beloved, we still are to pray. Pray that the Lord may show his mercy on those who do not know him and that he may cause them to believe. And don't worry. Don't worry about the consequences of your witness because God's word is a power to conquer the hearts of many. And it's a power by which he will judge those who close their very hearts to him and who reject him. God will be glorified. And as God's people, beloved, you are assured that the victory is yours. And so to the one who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be all the glory forever and ever. Amen.